culture is what presents us with the kinds of valuable things that can fill a life. And insofar as we can recognize the value in those things and make them part of our lives, our lives are meaningful, our lives are valuable. It's no great strain to wake up in the morning and go on living. Um, Nietzsche, I suppose, thought, and Schopenhauer and the people he was responding to thought that culture had failed in this respect, that culture was, and he didn't just mean high culture, he meant the ordinary culture of the West, had presented us with things which are like fool's gold. They have a certain sort of allure, and insofar as one is not especially reflective, one can find some sort of value in them. But when you got too self-conscious and too thoughtful about where these things come from, what they mean, and what kind of value they could possibly have, they no longer strike one as rewarding at all. One sees them more for what they are. And then the culture can't help you, because then the culture is just presenting you with things which anyone who's thoughtful and reflective and sophisticated can't take the right kind of comfort in. And Nietzsche, Nietzsche then thought, there is this massive project, which only a massive effort of individual creativity could possibly overcome to produce for oneself the kind of value which what the culture has failed to supply. You know, I can't speak for Nietzsche, but I just don't have that problem. I think there are two kinds of value. I think that there are, I think there really are objectively valuable things that are things that are valuable not because we care about them or take an interest in them, but simply because they have the nature they have. I think certain experiences are like this. So I think, I mean, to take the maybe the least interesting case, I think pleasure is like this. The felt experience of you know, physical pleasure is valuable not because we love it. I think you know, the, the right answer to the youth for a question in this case is that we love it because it's valuable. That is, we, when, when you're feeling good, you recognize in that feeling something that warrants Appreciation. And so that's an extremely small scale version of it. And I do think that some of the pleasures in, or some, let's see, set pleasure aside for a second. I think that some of the value inherent in nature, some of the value inherent in great works of art, some of the value inherent in human social relationships, like the relation of parent and child, or the relationships among friends, or relationships among teachers and their students. I think so many of these relationships and the activities that are constitutive of those relationships are valuable, not because we find them valuable. They're valuable in themselves. And we find them valuable because human beings are wired up to be sensitive to the value that's there already. I do think that there are other things which are valuable because we care about them, because we find them valuable. I think sports is like this, right? Sports are great. But if we were somehow not wired up to get a kick out of that kind of thing, to see any value in that kind of thing, it's not as if we would then be missing something. Those things wouldn't have that kind of value or any value at all if it weren't that we take them to be valuable and find some value in our encounter with them. So I think that there are two perfectly non-transcendent sources of value. Non-transcendent in the sense that the value doesn't derive from any kind of supernatural uh, cosmic force. This has no, none of this has anything to do with God or religion. There are the things in our lives and in ordinary experience that are valuable in themselves. And then there are the things that we confer value on by finding them valuable. And there are enough values of both kinds to generate the kind of meaning in life that the nihilists thought was problematic. The kind of problem you're asking me to address arises more for people who think about death. And I don't all that much. Um, so, you know, I occasionally have, you know, how Sartre describes these moments where all of a sudden things enter the horizon of possibility that just weren't there before at all. So Sartre describes a you know, housewife looking out the window, suddenly realizing that she could be a prostitute if she wanted to. And it's a true thought. This could 
it's something she could do. More things are possible than she normally takes into account. And death is sort of like that for me. It's one of these things that I occasionally glimpse as a real possibility. And then in those moments, I understand what the problem of nihilism is supposed to be. Because all of a sudden, there seems to be the thing present, which does threaten to trivialize, that is to suck the meaning out of all the things which otherwise give one's life meaning. But it goes away very quickly for me. I can imagine that to the extent to which one is gripped by the problem of nihilism is pretty closely connected by the extent to which one dwells on one's own death. And there the recipe is dwell less on death. <laughs>